Yeah. Or, or if I just got to the point where I was making, I was making that team, then I feel like okay. Yeah, I, I can, I can take mine and you bring in, put it in my daughter's room, and it'll figure out that it's in my daughter's room. Oh, okay. Yeah. Goes ahead and vacuums accordingly. It is nice that they can figure that out. Because, like, ours, like, if you look on the rack, it actually, like, adds different rooms. Yeah. Like, it realizes that. It just doesn't have the base to go back to, and it really moves that in my daughter's room. It's very not as often. I'm going, oh, I'm yeah, I'm scared of running out. Oh, yeah. Any stuff they have, they are all friends and text personalities. There's like an animal basket, and then like four, there's like a camper basket, and then is that also this cover? That's <laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Hey, we can actually, that's actually brighter than today. That's interesting. All right, so let me get this started. So sure enough, I will say, I purposely looked for the you know, like the most designer-looking person I could find, <laughs> and I did purposely look for black turtleneck, and then I went disapproving because it seems like every time I build something. And I show it to the designer. That's what I get. It's that disapproving look. Like, what did you just build? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I've actually, well, I'll talk about this in a moment. So, uh, sponsors. Uh, we've got a photo to provide the space and tech to provide the food. So, definitely want to thank them because you know, the meetup is kind of boring without either. Uh, upcoming meetups. So, March 28th, which is not the third Thursday, actually the fourth Thursday. Yeah. Uh, I never think of which one. Um, so it'll be March 20th. It's actually, is going to be uh, talking about accessibility testing. Well, I'm feeling good I picked that one. So, um, so yeah. So that, um, and sure enough, the reason for the, the date difference is that uh, I'm actually traveling the week before and the week before that. Um, so, uh, and then in June 20th, and yes, I have something scheduled all the way up to June. Uh, we're going to have Mike, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, uh, uh, I cannot remember. I'm drawing a blank right now. Her punch guy. Now I'm looking at, at, at Jay because Jay's. Here. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear you, Jay. Can you hear me now? Oh. I hope we're not having the same problem we had a couple months ago. Audio says my microphone says it's picking it up. Well, hold on. Let's figure this out real quick. My microphone says it has me. Let me switch back to... Why, why, why are there so many speaker options on Shouldn't matter. Michael Eaton. Eaton, thank you. That's who I was trying to think of. Um, the interesting part, I heard Jay earlier. I was talking to him. Right, we were. And then my my, my connection dropped. And the sound again, no, the sound is working on Twitch. This is the same problem we had the other, the other month. You know what? Let's do this. Well, here's the thing. That was working earlier. How about now? See, now I can hear Jay. There we go. All right. Well, we'll just, I'll just turn up the, the, the volume as much as I can. Well, I, I'd love to figure this out. All right. Uh, so I was talking about... Uh, uh, so, sure enough, Mike Eaton will be speaking June 20th. Uh, he's going to be talking about Spectre uh, console. Um, sure enough, interesting part about that. It's funny. He and I have been trying to schedule this, and it's like, oh, let's do January. Let's do February. Um, he was going to do it's either April or May, whichever. Uh, but it's the same week as, as the PJ uh, tournament, and there's like no hotels available. Uh, so, um, so hence he'll be here in June. Um, I'm working on April and May, so we will have. So, uh, the one thing I will say is I just found out tonight uh, we will be moving. Um, so, uh, 
a coda slash uh, a, 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 a deco um, is moving from this office. So, and not to a convenient location for, for us to have a meetup. So I am, I'm working on that. I've actually already been talking to Dan about the possibility of doing a slingshot, which is over at Hirschborn. So um, point being is, is I'm, I'm not sure when we're going to do the move, but sometime, uh, definitely by June, we'll probably be moved. So um, as far as Azure meetups, so, you know, we do have the, the little Azure meetup is started back up. Uh, so we meet down at, downtown at the Humana office. Um, so March 14th, we're going to talk about uh, using Azure BBC. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually a really interesting way to, you know, to have uh, uh, Azure AD type uh, services, but for external users. You know, so not for, you know, not for people internal, but, you know, um, so like I've used it, like, like the first time I used it, um, I was actually building websites for health clinics that were associated with employers. And so we were, you know, we were tying it in there to, you know, for their accounts. So really interesting stuff. Um, upcoming events. Uh, so nearby, we're supposed to have a global Azure bootcamp. I'm still going to try to do that. I just haven't got anything arranged. I forgot the exact date of April, but it's in April. Um, so look for more information in the next couple weeks because I, I, I need to start getting that organized. Um, as far as further away stuff. Um, there is the Michigan Technology Conference. Uh, it's in Pontiac, which is right outside Detroit. Uh, so that'll be March 21st to 22nd. So that, you know, um, it's a brand new conference. You know, so trying to, uh, you know, Michigan is kind of like hit and miss when it comes to events inside Detroit. You know? and, and so they're trying, again, to bring a great event there. Uh, so I, I will be there. I'll be speaking there. Uh, and then Star Trek is on May 3rd. So Star Trek is up in Columbus, Ohio. A really interesting conference because it's actually at a movie theater, and at the end of the day, you, you watch a movie. Um, I'm not sure what movie they're going to watch because it's normally the Marvel movie that comes out. Uh, well, uh, that would have been uh, 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 Deadpool, but Deadpool got uh, moved to July. So um, I noticed that Fall Guy's coming out that day, so I'm assuming that's what movie we're going to be watching. So just some upcoming stuff. Um uh, Coppola's is dead. It is dead. Fine. itself is dead. Um, I am trying to get back a a a, a done it use or uh, not a done it, but a, a code camp. Mm -hmm. um, I I need to start working on that because I, I do want to have that this fall. So so there will be an event. It just won't be a Coppola's. I mean, the good part is it will also be a much cheaper event because you know uh, we will run it like a code camp. Uh, so after uh, after night. Uh, we always go to either BJ's or, or Twin Peaks. Um, I'll leave it up to the group as to which one we go to. Um, okay, we're going to BJ's after the group. I can actually hear him right now. Yeah, it was way too loud. <laughs> Twin Peaks. Agreed, agreed. So, so we're going to BJ's afterwards, and I definitely invite everyone, everyone to join us. It, it is always a great time. All right. So with that, uh, so this month we got Jay Harris, um, great guy, great speaker. Um, sure enough, I have had the opportunity to attend this talk before. It is a really great talk. Uh, uh, look, anything Jay does, and I'm not saying it's just because Jay's right here. I mean, really, Jay is a, you know, he's just a great guy anyways. Um, but this is a great talk. And what I really like about this, I mean, like I said, I have attended this talk before. It really is for folks like me. I mean, like I say, I, I know what doesn't look right, but it doesn't mean I know how to build what looks right, right? And, and uh, you know, Jay goes a lot into that. So, you know, we're going to get a lot of that. All right. So with that, let me switch it over to Jay. I'm going to add his screen. And Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sweet. Thank you. Um, yes. So this is a talk, as the title says, is designed for non-designers from a non-designer. Um, we... We, we know that elegant design, um, user experience, UI, the look and feel of uh, application or website or really any composition at all. We know that elegant design requires talent, but that talent is not a prerequisite for avoiding bad design. Yet we feel like it is. Um, we argue that it is. We, we make excuses that it is. Oh, I'm not a designer. I didn't go to art school. I don't have a I don't have the design talent. I don't have the design bone in my body. So sorry. Uh, and we put together an application without any of that 
stuff. Not even just the elegance that does require the talent, but even just the, the basics, the fundamentals. Um, yet, when I built this talk years ago, uh, I recognized that uh, though software development certainly requires talent as well. I mean, there's no argument that writing good software requires talent, but software development also still has a lot of fundamentals. It has a lot of rules. I mean, we have, we have, we have tons of acronyms for how to build good software. We have so many acronyms for how to good, how to build good software that we have acronyms for our acronyms on how to build good software and good design, good composition also still has rules, still has fundamentals and software developers are good at following rules. So we, I built this out as to, to go over some of those basics, some of those fundamental rules, because right now our users, they, they hate us. They absolutely hate us. They want to flog us. They want to, I don't know, hopefully not yeet us out the nearest window, but sometimes they do. They certainly despise us in our choices for how we put together those interactions and those user experiences and those user interfaces. And at least with some of those basics, we can get that application to be a little bit better and have our users hate us a little bit less. So I'm Jay Harris. Uh, I am a software developer. I own a software consultancy, Arana Software. We're a, a software and marketing consultancy. Uh, as we say, we, uh, we put together the, uh, the human element of building the right thing and the technical element of building the thing right. Um, and uh, let's see, also a Microsoft MVP for a long time, a Microsoft regional director, even though, as we say, I don't work for Microsoft, I don't have a region and I don't direct anybody. Uh, and I've been doing this for a while. However, I'm not a designer. It wouldn't make much sense to have a talk about non-design for non-designers if I was a designer. I'm not a designer. I've been uh, a software developer for a long time now, well over 25 years, and have been developing front ends and user experiences and user interfaces for just about that entire time. Um, I cut my teeth uh, at, as they say, my, my, first, my first big boy, uh, employer was a brand identity firm in, in upstate New York. Uh, and throughout my career, I've worked very closely with designers and learned a lot of, uh, their language, learned a lot of their jargon. And maybe if just from osmosis, I've picked up a lot of what it is to, uh, build good design. But at the end of the day, I'm a non-designer. I'm still just a developer. Um, as we're getting into design on, on what it takes to have a good design, the first thing we must understand is why we have designers. Why do we need designers? What do they do? As, and as developers, we get this wrong. We get this entirely, utterly, completely wrong. Because of course, as developers, far too often what we say that the responsibility and the purpose of a designer is, is to make it pretty. What do designers do? Well, they make it pretty. And as I said, that's utterly wrong. It's completely wrong. Uh, the purpose of design, of any design, of good design is not about the pretty. It's not about designing the door to be pretty or the car to be pretty or the bridge that we drive over, the building that we live in to be pretty. So certainly the same applies to our applications and our website. It's not about the pretty, it's about usability. It's about making uh, that website appealing, um, cohesive, familiar, intuitive. And this uh, cohesiveness, this familiarity is just as important, absolutely just as important as that underlying business logic, that underlying core functionality. An example that I always use is doors, uh, the design of doors. Uh, think about a door, visualize the door in your head, not like the little doorknob door that's in your bathroom at the house, but you're walking into a commercial building, visualize the door from walking into a commercial building. Generally, it's going to have two interfaces. One interface for that door is going to be a horizontal bar. And the other interface for that door is going to be a vertical bar. And 
we know that when we approach uh, a door and it's got a horizontal bar, how do we open it? Well, we push it. And when we approach a door and it's got a vertical bar, likewise, we know that we need to pull it. And that's just the interface, uh, the user experience, if you will, of, of a door. And no one taught us how to use it. No one taught us how to use a door. There wasn't the, 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 the talk that you got when you were little was not, now, Jay, realize you're small yet. And you don't quite fully understand a door. But listen, when you approach a door and it's got a horizontal bar, you got to push it. But when you approach that same door, you got to grab that handle with all of your little three-year-old might, and you've got to pull it as hard. No one ever gave us that story. No one, no one instructed us on how to use a door. No one taught us how to use a door. We didn't learn how to use a door. A door learned how to use us. A door learned how to use us because that's the fundamentals of industrial design. You see, our muscular skeletal system, all the way that our bones are built and the way that our muscles are anchored to those bones are optimized for that movement of a horizontal bar or a vertical door. If you have a big giant box that you want to slide it across the room, your hands are going to be parallel to each other and you're going, you know, you're going to push it with your hands parallel, like a horizontal bar. And if that same box and you want to pull it across the room, you're going to grab onto the sides, your hands are going to be vertical and you're going to pull it. That's the way that our muscles and our bones are, are optimized. Our pectoral muscles are designed for that pushing and optimized when they are, uh, when our hands are horizontal, our, 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 our lats and our traps and our back are optimized when our hands are vertical. They're most optimized for pulling. The door learned how to use us. And really, those same fundamentals of industrial design apply not just to doors on a building, but to building um, a website. So we're going to go over the, we're going to start with six basic elements of what good design is, so that we can build an effective user experience for our website just as effectively as a good user experience for a door so that we don't violate what those rules are because at the same time we've all encountered a door that does think it's this one thing is super special and it violates those rules of good design we've all encountered a door that has a horizontal bar on both sides of the door and we approach it what do we do well we naturally think that we need to push on that door right but it's got a horizontal bar on both sides. So it's a 50-50 chance. Maybe you walk up to that door and you'll get lucky and you push on it and it'll open and out of the other side you walk up to that door and you push on it and it doesn't move and you just face plant yourself against the glass because someone violated the rules of design. So the six basic elements of design. First is unity. Unity is the sense of familiarity of this composition. It's the sense of uh, branding. It's the sense of cohesion. And there's two ways that we can get that uh, cohesion. First is the cohesion through structure. Uh, this is going to be uh, in, in an application or in the context of a website. I'm just going to stick with a website because predominantly I'm a web developer and that's the mind frame that I'm, I'm most used to. So when you're building out this website, the con cohesion through the structure is going to be the layout of that application. Most notably, that's going to be in some sort of grid system. Maybe we're pulling in some sort of uh, CSS library that helps us build out that grid, but we have some sort of consistent grid system for laying out uh, the entirety of our application, not just the columns of the content, but placing the header, placing the navigation, placing the footer. It's always going to be in the same place. It should always be in the same place. That cohesion, that unity is making sure that throughout your site, the header, the nav, the footer, they're always in the same place. And it really doesn't matter what sort of grid system you use. It absolutely does not matter what sort of grid system you use. You can have a three column grid, you can have a four column grid, you can have a five column grid. You can lay out your grid columns based on the Fibonacci sequence. It sounds ridiculous, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is that through your application, that layout is consistent. The second element, the cohesion through structure is of unity, is the cohesion through style. Um, 
with, uh, and, and just as the implications that come along with the word style when we're building out our website, most commonly we'll think of things like the color palette, the color choices that we use for our application. We'll dig into color quite a bit a little later. Uh, beyond color, there's also the font choices that we use, the typefaces uh, that we use. We will also dig into uh, typography uh, and fonts uh, in a little bit later. Um, but uh, there's always um, unity throughout these applications, throughout these websites. And altogether, what it really comes down to is building a story. Building a story that's uh, going to paint the perception of your application and allow your users to consume the information that you're presenting. It's about building that story. And there's always a story. Always, 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 always a story. The picture will always be painted in your user's head. It's what through these fundamentals, fundamentals, what's really up to you is controlling that story, driving that story, governing that story. It's up to you to tell the story because there's always going to be a story created in your user's head. Just a matter of if, if, if it's the story that you want them to consume or not. These three pie charts have unity. Uh, by having uh, some consistency in size, some consistency in color. In this case, the non-focused color uh, prov provides uh, cohesion through style. Their, their consistent position on the screen uh, gives them cohesion through uh, structure. But the inconsistency of the highlighted color, the, the orange and purple and green, the highlighted color on these three uh, pie charts paints a story. Whether you're governing it or not, it's always, always, always a story. This story is that there is no unity. So that must mean that there is no correlation between these elements. But there's always a story. Even when there's not unity, there's always a story. And we can govern that through this unity, through this cohesiveness. In this case, a cohesiveness through these data sets. Now that that highlighted color is consistent, the story shifts that there's probably some sort of association, some sort of similarity in these three different data sets. If they were disparate data, they wouldn't be together, just like the colors on the last version. But in this version now, because of the cohesion through style, because of that unity in the highlight color, the audience will assume a correlation. Uh, audience will assume a, a fami familiarity within these three different data sets. Maybe the, uh, the three graphs, uh, the three orange pieces are .NET developers at various tech conferences. Maybe the first one's got a larger slice of pie. Maybe that is the .NET developers at a .NET conference. And the, the, the second one has a smaller slice. So maybe it's the .NET developers at a Java or Python or Ruby conference. And maybe the third one, it's back to a larger data set, but not the biggest one. So maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's a, user interface or a JavaScript conference, something on React, have a lot of developers to it. There's always a story that's going to be told by your application. In cooperation and also in direct opposition, cooperation and also opposition to Unity is contrast. Contrast's job is on quickly identifying the primary ideas. It's also because of unity. Because of the unity, the contrast allows you instant recognition of the most important visual elements. There are five types of contrast that we can apply. First is shade. Second is color. Then position, shape, and size. These are the five different opportunities that we have for uh, contrast, and it can be applied in any aspect of your application, not just in, well, random circles that you're putting on the screen. Take text, for example. Using that contrast, we can draw out important elements on the screen. That's what contrast is for, instantly recognizing the important visual elements. On the left, because there is no contrast, there's only unity, if this were in English or if you could read Latin, you're going to start at the top left uh, of the first paragraph and then read all three paragraphs in sequential order. However, on the right, because of the contrast, 
your eye is drawn to that middle paragraph. Your focus is going to be drawn to the middle paragraph, and you're going to read that first. Maybe later you will also go back and read the first and third paragraphs for context. But the first focal point, the part that you read first, is going to be the element with the greatest amount of contrast. And there's always contrast. It's always part of the story. It's always building the story, even if that story is unintended. There's always contrast. Right now, where is your focus drawn on the pie chart and on the bar graph? Well, because of unity and color and having no other contrast on the screen, of course, you are going to be drawn to size. You are going to be on the left, the biggest pie piece. On the right, the biggest bar. That's where the contrast is. The contrast is purely on size. So your focus is going to be drawn there first. How about now? Just by changing to a different contrast pattern, something that's more stark than before, in this case using color, we can draw your eye elsewhere. It's now to the second size pie chart. It's now to the second size bar, all through contrast, all through telling that story and guiding the eyes and governing the story as it's perceived by the user. So we have unity and contrast. The third uh, element, the third fundamental is alignment. Uh, alignment is association based on the location of the elements that are a part of this composition that are displayed on the screen. Association based on the location of the elements. Of course, through this alignment, through their position on the screen, we know that all three of these paragraphs are related. When we're reading text, at least in our culture, in English, in most languages, all of that text is also going to be left aligned. When we're reading, we start at that top left. Text is going to be left aligned. It's great for reading large blocks of text. It's great for the consumption of large blocks of text. This is what you are already typically used to for creating your, your content in most languages, including in English. We also have right alignment. In our culture and in our language, we avoid this for large blocks of text. That's not how English works. However, it is more appropriate for other right aligned languages like Arabic or Hebrew. This is great for those appropriate languages. It's not appropriate for uh, languages that aren't uh, culturally uh, set up for this. This right aligned text is not great for large blocks of English. We also have center line. Center line comes off as very dull and immature. Uh, it does not capitalize on those natural alignments of the page, of the canvas, of the window. There's still an alignment there. Of course, we can see it right down through the center of that paragraph. But because of those uh, alignment choices, it's very hard to read. It's very slow for us to read any content that's center aligned. Um, this will work fine when it's um, small amounts of text. But generally, small amounts of text where you already know what it says. Um, wedding invitation is a good example. No one ever gets a wedding invitation by surprise. You don't ever get a wedding invitation by surprise. When a wedding invitation shows up in your mail, you already know what it is. You already know the couple that's getting married. You already know the information. You already know that so-and-so and so-and-so are getting married at such and such time and such and such a date. And that's exactly what the invitation gives you. This center aligned, wedding, center aligned wedding invitation gives you that information that you already have. Hey, so-and-so is marrying so-and-so at such and such a time, such and such a place. Can you come, yes or no? Short text, not appropriate for large amounts of text. What is also good for large amounts of text uh, is justified. Justified alignment is just a term that we give for aligned on both sides of the content, both sides of the text. This is phenomenal for read readability. This is phenomenal for cohesion. And it's the most productive text for speed, for consumption. The reason for all of that is the distractions, the distractions that come along with consuming content. When you're reading, it's sort of like a old school mechanical typewriter. 
You know, you're using the one where you have to punch the keys. You're punching the keys when you're typing. And eventually the thing will ding to let you know that you're getting close to that right margin. And then when you stop, you grab hold of that arm and you slam it all the way over to the left hand side. And then you start typing again. When you slam that slider on that old mechanical keyboard all the way to the left hand side, you're not going slow and measuring it. You're just sliding it over until it hits the stop. The machine already knows where that stop is, just like it already knows where the stop is on the right hand side. It's just going to the stops. And when you're consuming content based on the alignments, your brain works the exact same way. When you reach the end of a line of text that you are reading and you go on to the next line of text, your brain, when it's at least left alignment or certainly a justified alignment, your brain doesn't have to think about where that left margin is. It already knows from the previous set of lines, hey, that we'll call it 100 pixels from the left. Or I don't know if it's print one inch from the left side of the page. And it doesn't go hunting for where the beginning of that line is, it just knows. Send my eyes back for to 100 pixels from the left and start on the next line. There's no thinking, there's no distraction, there's no context switch. And us in software development, we already know the penalties and the evils of context switches and how much it slows down performance of the application. Likewise for reading, that context switch of sort of little kids in the back, uh, back seat of a car on a road trip. Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Oh, there's the beginning of line. We don't have that distraction. We just know that we've got to go 100 pixels from the left. And that's optimized with justify text because our eyes don't have to sit and think about are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? For the end of the line, it just knows that the line is going to end 100 pixels from the right. And if it ended before that, well, we're done with the paragraph. All things that eliminate the distractions, eliminate the context switches and make this the most uh, consumable piece of text, but all relying on those alignments. Those alignments are also what gives us uh, multi-column text. But multi-column text absolutely needs to be in justified, not even just left aligned, has to be in justified content. Because it's that consistency. So now it's you know 100 pixels from center instead of having to hunt for when the end of this line in this column ends. There's a consistency to it. Because otherwise, with that context switch, about trying to find the end of the line in the column, sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we'll be reading along on the first line and we'll just keep going. And now the words don't make sense anymore because we didn't even notice that we jumped the gutter, the white space that's in the center. We jumped the gutter onto the line of the next of the adjacent column and started reading and we completely lost everything. And now of course our train of thought is gone. The, 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 the speech bubble is gone. The, picture in our imagination of what we were reading about is gone. And we have that context switch of going back to where we were and rebuilding that story, rebuilding that speech bubble, rebuilding all of that context again. Um, so it's justified as this is important to for that readability in multi-column text. Now, when you're building all of that stuff, the alignments aren't just the alignments for the content itself. The alignments also apply to the other things on the screen, even if it is just the margin of the screen. The margin, of course, whether that be uh, the edge of the paper or the edge of the screen or the edge of the canvas. We certainly all encountered that photocopy that was slightly askew when we throw it through it through the Xerox. It's a little bit askew. And now all the content on the screen is just a little bit off. It's distracting. It's distracting. It's a context switch. It's that performance penalty of a context switch from that distraction. We can see it if, I don't know, if the artwork on the wall behind me was misaligned. When we, if we're, if we're standing really close to that painting, that artwork that's hanging on the wall, when we're very first hanging it on the wall, we can never really see if it's askew. We have to back away so that we can get the frame of reference, the alignments, from the rest of the canvas, from the wall, from the ceiling and the floor and the corners of our current wall and our, our other furniture and our other artwork and make sure that it's all aligned up with each other. Because the alignment capitalizes on everything. Of course, not just the 
edge of the canvas, but also the other elements on the screen, making sure that those alignments are uh, with each other, even if it's far away. The distance things still get that association and familiarity. And of course, even if there are no other elements on the screen, they don't even have to be on the same screen. This isn't just necessarily a paragraph of text that's at the top of the screen and a paragraph of text that's on the bottom of the screen. Think of this and extend this all the way through the headers and footers. Even if you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling for three, four, five monitor heights worth of content, your header and your footer will still need to be aligned with each other, even if they're not both on the screen at the same time. And then we're making a composition out of all of this stuff. We could further see those alignments. The left side of the header aligns with the left side of the content. The top side of the content aligns with the top side of the bar graph. The only thing remaining is what we refer to as trapped white space, this odd shaped blob that exists between the textual content and the bar graph. We can, of course, clean that up by further creating and capitalizing on alignments, in this case, using justify text of the text content to have the right edge of the content aligned with the left edge of the bar chart. And there's still going to be a little bit of trapped white space here. We got this, I don't know, if you can see it, this white blob, it's like a shape like a backwards L, vertically existing between the text content and the bar graph, and then moving off to the left um, as the paragraph ends early. We can eliminate that farther still by using right aligned text, but don't do this. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. The, right, the justified text in this case is enough. Using something like this, using right aligned text in order to fully eliminate and capitalize on the alignments, fully eliminate the trapped white space, that's that's a little above our pay grade as non-designers. Leave choices like this to the folks that actually went to law, to art school, the folks that are actually doing uh, the design work rather than just the non-designers on the team. Okay, so we went through the first three. We have uh, unity, we have contrast, we have alignment. Next, fourth is proximity. So whereas alignment creates an association based on the location of the elements. Proximity creates meaning based on the location. Proximity is your why to your story. That proximity helps create the story. On the left, seemingly linear, linear plot, everything went right. And the one on the right, well, there's that one dot, that one plot that's out of place. It's creating a story. The story is the story that you're already painting in your head is the one on the left is the good and the one on the right is the bad. The one on the right, because there's that one dot out of place, you're already painting the story in your head that something went wrong. That's not some place where we did extra well. That's some place that's out of line. That's some place where something went wrong. That's the story that's being painted purely by proximity of these elements on the screen. Or four icons, same four icons on both sides, painting a story. Presumably the story is on the left, we have a married heterosexual couple with two kids. And on the right, not so much. Same four icons. The only difference is the proximity, building the story that's in your head. Uh, that proximity influences how we interpret uh, data. Are the rows more important? Are the columns more important? Overall, it just really drives how we view the flow. Is it stable? Is it inconsistent? Is it complete chaos with all of our data points? Drives the interpretation of groups. You might see this on a web application is associating, a, uh, I don't know, the field labels with our text boxes on a form. 
Of course, they're going to be grouped together, or at least should be. The name field is the label. The name label is directly associated with and in proximity with the name text box. The birth date label is in proximity to the birthday text box. And yet we've encountered applications where that proximity was off. Maybe there are two different text boxes and the field label is somewhere in between. And you have to, I guess, tinker at best. You have to guess on does this field label go with the one above it or the one below it? Because the proximity is off. Because they missed that fundamental element of composition and design. Fifth, we have unity, contrast, alignment, proximity. Fifth is hierarchy. So that gives us the relationship between the elements on the screen, not just the association. Now we're getting all the way into the relationship. Three examples of hierarchy of elements on the screen. On the left, the center is bigger. The core has priority. Think of this as maybe a security or a protection detail, the secret service for the president. Of course, the core, the president, is going to be the most important thing. All of the Secret Service members, all of that security detail will lay down their lives in defense of the center, in defense of the core. A good analogy for the center example, where everything, the core and the outliers, all have equal priority, is sports. Let's say soccer. Uh, the center, the core, is the ball. And the elements around it are the players. The ball and the players all have equal priority. Of course, we want to protect the ball. We want to get the ball into the opponent's goal and make sure that the ball doesn't go into our own goal. It seems like the ball is the most important element of this hierarchy, but get a penalty. And now our side only has 10 players while their side still has 11. And we're disadvantaged because we've lost one of the players, one of those spokes, one of those outliers. And we're not going to fare as well in our team. Protecting the goal and protecting the players are both of equal priority. And on the right, the child has priority. The core has a lesser priority. Those outliers, those spokes, those, those leaf nodes all have the most important priority. Um, maybe this is a parent and children. In opposition of the left, where all of the leaf nodes, the uh, security detail protecting the center, protecting the president, uh, they will sacrifice themselves in defense of the core. A parent presumably will sacrifice themselves in protection of either any of or all of their children. The children have the greatest priority. We'll see this commonly in text. The page title, highest priority. The article titles, Second priority beyond that. And then all of the content, the byline, the date, whatever else on the articles have the lowest priority. Think of the New York Times. Visualize the New York Times in your head. The New York Times, the banner. The New York Times is the biggest text. It's the biggest text on the page. It's the most important thing on the page that you can identify that this is the New York Times. And from that, know that this is a newspaper. You know exactly what it is. You have some expectations on the content that you're going to get out of it because of this giant text at the top of the New York Times. And it is always the biggest element. Well, rare exception. Rare exception. Like a war broke out. Not going to happen very often. The New York Times is the biggest thing. The titles of the articles on the page, wherever they happen to be, the second priority. The regular text, the content inside of those articles is the least priority. Imagine for a moment that same front page of the New York Times, if all of the text, all of the text from the New York Times to the article titles to the content, all of the text is the exact same font size, with the exact same font face, and the exact same font weight. It'd be much harder to consume, much harder to consume. The only way that you could know where the articles to begin and end is really just to read the content. You'd already have to have read all of it to know what any of it is. 
And even then, you're going to struggle. You're going to be reading an article, and all of a sudden, you get to this new line that doesn't make any sense. Because, of course, it's in normal world, it's the header of the next article. But when it's all the same text, you don't really know. The last element uh, that we have, the last fundamental concept is white space. White space is the visual breathing room that we have for our uh, content. And we can get rid of all of our white space. We can put everything on the screen at the same time. We can create a lot of congestion. Now, all the stuff is going to be very tight. It's going to be very uncomfortable. Everything's thrown on the screen at once. We commonly do this a lot as software developers. If we have some sort of configuration page, some sort of advanced setup, some sort of big form that we have to do, we're going to cram all of the stuff on the screen, all of the fields, all of the form fields. It's all going to be there on one screen so we don't have to scroll, so we can get through all of this stuff as quickly as possible. And our users say, stop. Way too much. They we're overwhelmed. We've all seen those forms. There's no white space where everything is thrown on the page at once, and it's just overwhelming. Adding that white space, providing that white space gives us focus. It gives us importance for our elements. Maybe. Could also make some of our elements feel lonely make some of the elements appear insignificant. Now that may sound a little weird, but we've gone through all of the things like how proximity is the why and how, how uh, hierarchy establishes the relationships. White space is our emotion. White space is the emotion of the composition. Maybe you do want things to be all tense and tight and constrained and there's way too much stuff on the screen. Maybe you're, I don't know, making an application, making a poster for a horror movie. And that's the type of emotion that you want to convey. And that's okay. That's appropriate for that design, that composition. Your white space is your emotion. And all of these together are the story that you present to your users. And this always 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 a story it's always a story the purpose of all of this the purpose of what makes applications makes websites comfortable makes websites usable makes websites intuitive is when you're conscious of and in control of that story that you're presenting that you're telling to your users to your consumers Back when we were first discussing Unity, I said that we would go over color. So this is the color that we're used to. Screen colors. Primary colors are red and green and blue. And a composition of these three primary colors give us every other primary color that we can fathom, or at least that we can present on a digital screen. This is in contrast to the print color wheel. The print color wheel, the primary colors are cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, C-M-Y-K. The difference between these two is that the uh, blend of colors from the RGB wheel, from the screen color wheel, is additive versus the print color wheel, everything being subtracted. In other words, if you take all three colors and you turn that dial up to 11 on all three colors and blend them all together, when it comes to screen colors, blending them all together gets white. That's additive to full light. Whereas on the print side, blending all of those colors gets us to black or at least a very dark gray. Remember mixing your Play-Doh together as a kid or mixing different types of paint together, getting to that black or that very dark gray. Because as we mix all the colors together, the color goes away. It's a subtractive color. However, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, some really old bearded white dude created this one, the artistic color wheel. Because as we were growing up as kids, when we were still in, I don't know, second grade, we didn't know that the primary colors were red and blue 
green, we were taught that the primary colors were red and blue and yellow. Even our Ziploc bags taught us that yellow and blue make green, even though it doesn't. We know that when we're mixing together colors in our, I don't know, our CSS color hex, there's no way for us to mix together yellow and blue to make green. It doesn't happen. But when it comes to art, this is the color wheel that's used. So the primary colors are red and blue and yellow. And this is the color wheel that we work off of for designs, for compositions, for art, for unity. It's a bunch of different methods that we can use for choosing a color palette to, to base our websites off of when we're building that cohesion through style through color. The first option we have is monochrome. Now, this graphic is a little bit off. Uh, it's misleading because a monochrome color palette isn't a pie slice. A monochrome color palette is a straight line, a single line coming directly out of the center across all of the tints and shades of that color. Tints are when we take a color, blue, and we add white to get light blue. Shades are when we take a color and we add black to make it darker, so we turn our blue into dark blue. The third option is uh, when we add gray. Those are called tones. So our tints are when we add white, our shades are when we add black, and our tones are when we wash out a color with gray. We turn our blue into, not really a, a label for it, we turn it into bluish gray. Um, our monochrome takes a single line out of the center and just takes different shades and tones and tints of blue to build our color palette. So our color palette literally would just be blue, light blue, and dark blue. Monochrome color palettes are very mellow. They are very clean. They have a very, very low contrast. And we already talked about contrast is important. Contrast is how we quickly identify the most important visual elements on the screen. So by using a monochrome color palette, we take away one of those options, color, from our array of contrast options. Because of this low contrast, monochrome color palettes are very challenging to use, especially for the inexperienced, like us, the non-designers. So when it comes to a monochrome color palette, don't use it. Next up is analogous. Analogous is really getting into that pie slice. So we'll take the center pie slice, in this case, the blue, that will be our primary color. And we take the two adjacent slices next to it, like, in this case, the cyan and the purple. They match very well together and create a serene and, and, and comfortable design. Um, analogous color schemes are often found in nature. They're very harmonious, they're very pleasing. We know, mostly see them in nature because of camouflage. Um, along the same lines of squirrels are brown because trees are brown, because tree trunks are brown, because tree branches are brown. The pink squirrels would have been easily identified and eaten long ago. So there are no more pink squirrels. There's just brown squirrels because of camouflage. Now they're all not the exact same color brown and they can hide in many different things. Sometimes squirrels are or gray, sometimes squirrels are dark brown and they'll still hide just fine on, on any of the analogous colors, the uh, neighboring colors that is this color palette. So that makes them harmonious. That makes them very visually pleasing to the eye. Uh, if you do use an analogous color palette, make sure you choose one color that dominates. That's going to be the center one, in this case, blue. And the other, the second to support, pick one. Whether you're choosing the purple or the cyan, pick one. Whichever that one that you choose is going to consistently be your secondary color throughout your website, throughout your application. The third color, along with black or white or gray, the third color with black or white or gray will just be used as an accent. Now, it's important to choose these ahead of time before you really get digging into building out your application, which one is going to be your secondary, which one is going to be your tertiary. We already know the primary is blue because that's the one in the center. But which one is going to be your secondary has to be consistent throughout your application. You don't want this one web page to be mostly purple as a secondary. And you don't want the next web page to be mostly blue or mostly, sorry, mostly cyan 
as your secondary. That violates all of the unity and the fundamentals that we're trying to create with our website. So choose the dominant one, in this case is blue, choose the secondary support it, maybe the purple, and keep that third, the cyan, to be uh, as the accent color. And stick with that consistency, maintain the unity. However, again, this analogous color palette is used a lot for camouflage, which by its very definition is to reduce and maybe even eliminate contrast. And we need that contrast to be able to quickly identify the most important visual element. So because of the low contrast when it comes to analogous palettes, don't use it. Third, complementary. Complementary, it's a dumb name. I think it's a dumb name. Complementary is the opposites inside of the color palette. Whichever color that you choose on this artistic uh, red, blue, yellow color palette, it's complementary color is the one on the exact opposite side of that color, color palette. So red and green or orange and blue. Uh, that makes these color palettes very, very, very vibrant. They're very high contrast, but they're difficult. They can be jarring. They're certainly not appropriate for text. Think about putting red text on a green background. It's hard to read. And a lot of that is because when it comes to a complementary color uh, palette, these two colors are in direct opposition with each other. They hate each other. They do literally hate each other. And there is conflict whenever these two colors encounter each other. And because of that, they're most commonly separated a little bit by their third accent color. But of course, since this is a complementary palette, it's predominantly just two colors. The primary color, pick whichever one you want to be your primary, and its opposite complementary color, that will always be your second. Um, and the tertiary will be a black or uh, a white or a gray. Even if it's just a little pen line, just providing a little bit of mediation between these two colors that are in conflict with each other, that hate each other. Um, example I use uh, is I grew up in upstate New York, in western New York, not far from Syracuse University. Of course, Syracuse University, its colors, the university's colors are orange and blue, complementary colors, very vibrant, very high contrast, and the colors hate each other. So whichever one on this palette is the primary, because sometimes it's a blue S on an orange background, sometimes it's an orange S on a blue background, it's always a little thin pen line around that S to serve as a mediator. Just a little, a little bit of separation, a little bit of go sit in your corner to these two colors. Complementary colors are very tricky to use in large doses. They work well when you want something to, to stand, work well when you have something that you want to stand out, but they're very tricky to use. They're really bad for text and they need hand-holding because they need that mediator. And because of the challenge behind that, don't use it. Fourth option, split complementary. Split complementary is if we take the complementary of, you know, dialed up to 11, split complementary dials that intensity down just a little. So in this example, blue is our primary. We no longer, before we could choose uh, if we wanted orange to be our primary and blue as our secondary or blue as our primary with orange as our secondary. But here, because of the split, the split is around the secondary color. It's sort of a blend between an analogous color palette, a camouflage, uh, and a complementary color palette. So that secondary color, in this case, blue is the primary. So the secondary would have been orange. And we take the two analogous slices that are on either side of that secondary color. So in this case, our secondary and, and tertiary colors would be this reddish orange and more yellow. Like with before, we already know which one is our primary, but there's a little bit of debate on which one you want to be your secondary and your tertiary color. It doesn't really matter. Just pick one and use that consistently. If you want secondary, your secondary to be the reddish orange, cool. Maintain that consistency throughout your entire design. No, if you want your secondary to be the yellow, awesome. Maintain that consistency throughout your entire design. Don't switch back and forth on which one is your secondary and which is one is your tertiary throughout the design. Maintain that unity. Maintain that consistency. This color scheme um, 
split complementary still has very, very strong contrast. Not quite the same as the complementary on its own. So it dials it back down. It has a little bit less conflict. It has a little less tension. This split, uh, color palette, split complementary, is a very good choice for beginners, for non-designers like us. It's difficult to mess up, and it doesn't have that tension of straight complementary um, palette. So this is a good one to use. When you're trying to go and build out a new color palette, use something like this. Fifth, triadic, like a triangle. Three colors that are evenly spaced around this color wheel. Uh, there's a lot of harmony here. It's very vibrant. Uh, this color palette works even if you are using pale or unsaturated versions of your colors, of your hues. Um, you'll commonly see this as, I don't know, in the candy aisle, your grocery store around Easter time, where all of the, you know, uh, candy of, you know, little bunnies is in a, a, a pastel yellow and a, a pastel blue and a pastel pink. It's a triadic color palette. Even with pale or unsaturated colors, there's still a lot of harmony to, you, to, to it. To use the triadic uh, harmony successfully, um, those colors should be very carefully balanced. Still let one dominate. Use the other two for the accent. Still with the other two for the accent, choose which one is your secondary uh, and maintain that unity, that consistency. Don't switch back and forth between the two. But with this harmony, it's still difficult to find that proper balance between these three colors. So this one is not a good one for beginners. Don't use it. And then the sixth example uh, I have for you is uh, tetradic. Tetradic is, it's a rectangle, not a square. So this takes that split complementary idea and takes it a little farther. So whereas in the split complementary, we took the two analogous color palettes off of what would have been the secondary, so turning the orange into the reddish orange and the yellow, this also does the same thing on the primary side, taking the two analogous uh, slices on either side of what would have been the primary. Uh, these offer uh, a l very rich color schemes, and there's a lot of possibilities for variation using this tetradic uh, color palette. This also requires a balance between your warm and cool colors. Your warm colors are going to be uh, your reds, your oranges, your yellows on one side of the color wheel, you, as opposed to your cool colors, which are going to be your greens and your blues and your purples, more common colors that are gonna be on the opposite side of the color palette. So when you're using a tetradic color palette, again, pick one, that will be your dominant color. Your secondary color will be the one of the options from the opposite side of the color wheel. So if your primary is a warm color, your secondary must be uh, a cooler color. Uh, and maintaining that balance between the warm colors and the cool colors on your tetradic palette are also still a challenge. Difficult for uh, uh, novices and non-designers to use, so don't use this color palette. Now, I know what you're thinking. You went, Jane, you just spent all of this time. It feels like 20 minutes just going through six different color palettes and you were sitting there, only allow this one. The rest were all, don't use this one, and 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 don't use this one. Like, thanks, Dad, why'd you waste all of my time with this stuff? Why did you waste all my time in the first place? Well, we're non-designers, so we're not going to build our own color palettes. We're going to use some sort of tool that builds out our color palettes for us. My favorite is a website by Adobe called color.adobe.com. Color.adobe.com is wonderful for building out all of these color palettes. However, I also know if you're anything at all like me, you're going to want to play with all of the bells all of the whistles, all the toys that are on this website. The first thing that it's going to ask you when you're building out a color palette is, what kind of color palette do you want to use? Do you want to choose a monochrome palette, an analogous color palette, a complementary, a split complementary, a triadic color palette? And you're going to say, Jay didn't talk about these. Let's go try out one of these other fun new ones too. Now you know which ones are going to work for you. Now you know of all of those different options, which ones are going to be most effective, what they do, what you should steer toward split complementary, and what you should steer away from, everything else. Now, one element I've gotten uh, asked about regularly with choosing these color palettes is what about the psychology of color? 
because I heard that, you know, when you're painting your house, when you're internally painting your house, you should use something like, I don't know, orange for the office, because that will give you a lot of energy and help you be more productive. But you should use something like blues in your bedroom, because blue is in the nice, cool color of blue. It's very calming and help wind you down at the end of the day and help you get effective sleep patterns. No, you don't care. The psychology of color is not for you. Um, sure, yellow is for happiness, like emoji, like smileys, but so is white. Black is the color of sophistication, but so is purple, because in many cultures, purple is associated with royalty, sophistication. Some cultures, so is pink. The psychology of color is very cultural based. And most of our websites are multicultural that we're, uh, for the audiences we're targeting. Also, there's really not a tremendous amount of stock in the psychology of colors. Most people, when they're choosing a color palette, when they're choosing a color, they really just go for the one they like. Blue is a very popular color for a car. If blue is also really about being mellow and calm and helping me fall asleep, that seems like a really bad idea for a car. You know, behind the wheel of a car is the last place that I'd want someone to fall asleep. So people choose cars because it's the color they like. They like buy a blue car because they like the color blue. They buy a red car because they like the color red. They like a black car because they like the color black. Of course, you know, it's not it doesn't extend everywhere. People buy a brown car because that's the only one left on the lot. But generally, it's just about the color that they prefer the most. What you should be concerned about as a developer, as a non-designer, is the accessibility of color. Because statistically, people are joining, out of all of us that are joining us for this presentation, somebody is colorblind even if only partially. See, we are uh, trichromatic uh, beings. We see in three different colors. We see in three different colors. That's why all of our color wheels, and regardless of how they are, are based off of three different primary colors. And the primary colors that we see, of course, are red and blue and green. And inside of our eyeballs is a special type of cell called a cone. And there are three different types of cones in our eyes. Some are uh, designed for longer wavelengths, the redder side of the light spectrum. Some of them are optimized for medium wavelengths, the greener side of the color spectrum. And some of them are designed for short wavelengths, the bluer side of the spectrum. And color blindness is when there is, generally it's a deficiency in one of those types of cones in our eyes. Maybe our green-based cones, oversimplifying the language a little bit for the sake of explanation, maybe our green-based cones in our eyes are not as efficient, or maybe they don't exist at all. Those are what lead to the different types of color blindness that we have in, uh, in our society, amongst our population. One of those types of color blindness is the protan. The protons are the ones that have deficiencies in the longer wavelengths. This is, we'll typically see this in, um, it, it, this is a style of red green color blindness because those longer wavelengths are the red. So, and again, still oversimplifying, but for the sake of explanation, let's say we had two different colors, even give you the CSS hex codes because we're generally used to CSS hex codes. Take those two different colors and their only difference is red. So we have what is for a normative sight person, very pink, and another one that's very blue. The only difference between the two is the red aspect, the long wavelength of the light spectrum. If we remove red and view it through the eyes of a proton, now they're both close shades of lavender. The pink and blue that were otherwise very easy to tell apart for a protan, not so much. Or our dutans that have a deficiency in the medium wavelength, that greener aspect. Let's take yellow and red, two colors that in their hex code differ only in the green aspect, even though these neither one of these colors are green. 
Well, we only see in three primary colors, red and blue and green, and all of our colors are a blend of those three colors. We can represent that in our hex codes. If it's zero, zero, that means that color is all the way off. And if it's FF, that means that color is all the way on. And this yellow that's almost mustard and ketchup differ only in their green. But remove green from the visual spectrum, and now we get, I don't know, more brown and baby poo brown. Imagine going into your refrigerator and not really even being able to tell the difference between the mustard and the ketchup. You have to read the label every time, or maybe the shape of the bottle, some other element of contrast that isn't color to differentiate the two. Our tritons, tritonopes have different deficiencies in short wavelengths. Uh, they're blue-yellow colored blind. So let's take two colors that have nothing to do with blue and yellow, pink and orange. Two colors that in their hex value differ only in the blue aspect of the color spectrum. But let's remove the blue aspect from the color spectrum. Now there are two shades of rose, two reddish pink. Nothing to do with the previous colors, but now very little contrast between the two. The accessibility of the colors is what we need to be most concerned about when it comes to this. And there are a lot of tools. Google is your friend on this one for finding whichever one is your favorite. There's a lot of tools to help you identify and even can represent to a normative person what this color choice, this color palette would look like to someone that suffers from any one of these three uh, color deficiencies. And then, of course, typeface. Our fonts, our font sizes, anything that we're using to display words on a screen. First and foremost is the classification of our colors. We can start with our serif fonts as one of the classifications of our text. And this is serif, not serif. It really is serif not serif. This font is book antiqua. And of course, what is a serif? Well, most people just assume or have heard, been told that it's that weird little foot on the bottom of the letter form. But it's not just the feet. A serif font, the serifs are also the little sticky outy parts on the top of the S or on the top back of the R. Any of those little uh, extensions on the letter form are serifs, but a traditional serif font also has other aspects. There is a stress, as it's called, to the letter form. That stress is a variation from thick to thin throughout the line of the letter form. In most serif fonts, that stress is angled. There are other serif fonts where that stress is entirely vertical and not at an angle, but that's still there. That thick and thinness throughout the letter form creates contrast. And that contrast, of course, is good for us. That contrast helps us create or help us quickly identify the visual differences in an object, even when it comes to letter recognition inside of a letter form. Serif is great for large amounts of text. When you have large amounts of text, I highly recommend that you use a serif-based font. Um, for you folks that have been around in the industry like me for a long time, you may remember that there was a time where we were told never ever to use a serif-based font on the screen. But that was 20 years ago when the maximum resolution of our monitors was 640 pixels by 480 pixels. We've gotten a little bit higher pixel density since then. And because that, we can really show off the variance in the stress of these letter forms. Serif letter forms are the most easy to read. They're the fastest to read. That's why every newspaper, every book that you read is going to use a serif font. So much so that you notice when someone has published a book in a sans serif font, it doesn't have that stress that doesn't have those extensions on the letter form. And when you see a sans serif font in a book, eh, you're gonna think it's a little less quality book or it's gonna be a little bit more amateur or a little, less, a little more boring. And a lot of that is due to that context switch, that distraction, 
that lack of unity and familiarity that you have with the industry. Um, the sans serif fonts, this one is called humanist. Number one, they don't have the serifs, the little extensions on the letter form. And sans serif fonts are also uh, typically mono weight. Mono weight means the line of the letter form, the line of the S is consistent thickness throughout the entirety of the letter form. Mono weight, not mono space. Counting the spacing consumed by each letter, they are mono weight in that the weight of the line in the letter form is consistent throughout the letter form. Sans serif works well for things like headers, small pieces of text, headers, um, tops of your articles, something where there isn't a large blocks of, uh, of text. The third category is our script fonts. Um, this script is Edwardian. It takes a lot more effort to read script, even if nothing because of familiarity. Partially, it takes more effort to read because of unfamiliarity. Partially, that that slowness in reading is just because of the cosmetic scripts fonts usually have a lot of extra cruft inside of the font. They are attractive. They are very elegant, but they're slow to, re slow to read. When you use this, generally you're going to use this in something where your consumers already know what it says, like a wedding invitation. So-and-so is marrying so-and-so at such and such a time, such and such a place. Are you coming? Yes or no, none of it is new information. You already knew when you were get, they were getting married. You already knew the when and the where they told you months ago. This is just them trying to identify a final headcount so they know how many dinner, plates of dinner to, to cook up. You already know what it says. It's elegant. It's beautiful. It's not for quick consumption of information. Do not ever use script fonts in all caps. Do use them in very large font and do use them sparingly. Places where it already, you already know what it says, like the logo for Coca-Cola. And finally, decorative fonts, like Curls MT or Comic Sans. Use this in very small quantities. Use this on very special occasions, like, hey, I'm building a flyer for my Halloween party. Perfect for a decorative font. Don't use this elsewhere. Now, there was a time where some decorative fonts would excel, like Comic Sans. Comic Sans does have readability imp improvements for people that suffer from dyslexia. However, there have been much better improvements in typography since then, and there are better fonts to use that also are have improved legibility for folks with dyslexia over Comic Sans. So still, don't use these decorative fonts. Now, when you're choosing out these fonts that you want to use on your website, the most important thing is that you want conflict or that you don't want conflict. You only want contrast. And conflict can come from, uh, conflict's bad. Conflict comes from using fonts that are too similar from each other. So on those four categories, your uh, serif, sans serif, uh, script, and decorative fonts, at most, if at all, use one font from each of those categories. Choosing two fonts from one single category will create conflict in your website. For example, how many of you really know the difference between Helvetica and Arial? Probably not too many. Probably even fewer that can look at a printed out page and say, nope, that one's Helvetica. That one's not Arial. However, your brain knows something's off. If I printed one paragraph in Helvetica and the very next paragraph in Arial, your brain would be able to identify that there is a difference. Maybe not what the difference is, but it would identify that there is a difference, that something is off, that there is a conflict inside of this composition. Very similar to that Xerox copy that's slightly askew. There's a conflict in this composition. So choose at most one font type from each of those four categories because what you do want is contrast. But that conflict versus contrast extends more than just the font choice. This is also in the other things like the font size. Don't use font sizes that are too close to each other. You cannot build contrast 
between a 10 point font and a 12 point font. You need more than that. You can identify the contrast between a 10 point font and a 14 or a 10 and a 16, but you get them too close together and then it's just a distraction. And what is the distraction? A context switch, a performance hit on consumption of your data. You cannot contrast 10 point with 12 point. You need something, a bigger difference than that. 10 to 14 or 10 to 16 would work. Now that four point font difference from 10 to 14, though it works at 10 point, that doesn't mean that it'll work on a higher point size. If your font size is 180, it's going to be conflict if your other font size is 184. They're too close together. So when you have contrast, make sure that it is a definitive contrast. 80 maybe needs 90, 180 probably needs 200 or 220. Larger differences create contrast. The little subtle differences just create conflict. Fonts also have a texture. Texture is tough to explain. We don't have good language for describing texture. How do you really describe the texture of cotton versus the texture of polyester? You know, one it might be smooth and one might be rough. Okay, but you know, how do you differentiate then contrast between or cotton between polyester and sandpaper? One is just rougher. We don't really have good language for that. So texture is that same sort of, uh, of, there's a texture to a font and make sure that if you're choosing the texture of a font, uh, make sure that again, we have contrast, not conflict. Make sure those differences are big. And the same holds true for the color of our font. But in this case, when we're talking about the color of our font face, of our typeface, we're not talk talking about red versus blue. Think of the color of your font as more how much ink would come out of the printer to build this letter form. These three font, these three font examples here, they're all serif based fonts. They're all mono weight fonts. They're all the exact same size, the exact generally similar uh, uh, letting and kerning between the letter forms and the words, but you can certainly see that there's a different amount of ink that's going to go on the screen. It might closely relate to font weight, but no one's going to say that the one on the left is a bold font and the one on the right is not a bold font. This is still just their regular uh, type size, the regular letter form size and the regular uh, weight for it their respective fonts. Now, when you're building all of this out, start with your base font. Sometimes that's a struggle, especially if you're building a web page, because oftentimes when you're building a web page, you start with the big header, you start with that H1, you start with the top of the page, building out your H1 and work your way down. So all too often, the non-designers will start their CSS design with styling out that H1, but then they run out of contrast room when they make their way down into the smaller letter forms, the smaller content, the regular content through their hierarchy and they end up creating conflict instead of contrast. So start at the style for the standardized text, the body copy, if you will. Figure out what that's going to be ahead of time and you work your way up in the hierarchy through your various header sizes up to your, your H1s. Start at the standard copy, start at the body copy and work from there and use res that restraint. Too many faces, too many variants can make your design look like a ransom note with letters clipped out of a magazine and glued onto your web page. Make it look like yet another forwarded email from that crazy uncle or the Comic Sam notification from work that usually indicates that there's some leftover donuts by the printer. There's not a lot of professionalism to those things. So it's use restraint so that you can maintain your unity, maintain your, comp your contrast, and the other elements. So uh, putting this all together, when we're building out a composition, start your story, you govern the story and the governing uh, that story starts with the focal point, but it's your story, you're in control. You are in control so you decide where that focal point is. It doesn't really matter where it is, just make sure that it's deliberate, choose. When you're grouping information, make sure that you're maintaining appropriate proximity for all of that information, like keeping a form label, a field label, very, very, very close proximity to its correlating input or, or text box. 
and maintain those strong alignments and recognizing that it's not just the alignments of the individual lines on your body copy. It's alignments with absolutely everything on the canvas. This is hideous. This hurts your head. Certainly hurts my head. But we can clean that up with some alignments. Only difference between these two compositions is the alignments. And this one already looks much more polished, much more professional, purely from the alignment. Now recognize the alignments aren't just the page title being left aligned with the menu, being left aligned with the header, being left aligned with the body copy. There's more alignments than there. It's also the top of the body copy that's aligned with the top of the bar graph. It's also the alignments on the left side of the canvas being aligned with the right side of the canvas. Your margins, if you will. Print out a Word document where the left margin is an inch and a half and the right margin is only a half an inch. That's going to be distracting. Remember, distractions are context switches. Context switches are performance hits. So we want to make sure we get as little, we eliminate as much of the distraction as possible. Have as little distraction as possible and repeat yourself. That's where our unity comes from. That's where our cohesion comes from. That's where the core of our website is, making sure that the header is always in the same spot. The nav is always in the same spot. That little hamburger menu icon is always in the same spot that the footer is always in the same spot, aligned in the same way. And from that, we can get our contrast, recognizing that this is not contrast. These are too close together. This is not contrast. This is contrast. For quickly identifying the most important elements. And follow the rules. Sure, we have talked for a little over an hour now, gone through some basic fundamentals. You know a little bit about the rules, but you don't really know the rule. And before you can break the rule, you got to really know the rule. You have some fundamental concepts. You don't really have that strong familiarity, that deep, deep knowledge of those rules. You don't. Nor do I. So follow the rules. Don't break them. For some fur further reading. Two books that I absolutely recommend for some further reading. One is a book by Nancy Duarte called Slideology, a fantastic book about building uh, slide presentations, PowerPoints, keynote presentations, what, whatever. Now, of course, you know, hey, Jay, this seems silly. I'm building websites. I'm not, I'm not a speaker. I'm not building presentations. But composition is composition is composition. It's the same rules of composition the same six fundamentals, where we're, whether we're building a PowerPoint deck or whether we're building a, uh, a, a Halloween flyer or we're building a website. It's the same fundamental rules of composition. Slideology covers those rules of composition wonderfully just in the context of building uh, a PowerPoint presentation. You can find this on Amazon for like 25 bucks. Also, another wonderful book, The Non-Designer's Design Book by Robin Williams. Not that Robin Williams, Dr. Robin Williams. She created this wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, it's now in its fourth edition, the non-designer's design book that uh, uh, lots of pictures, really thin book. You can read it quickly and it goes through some great descriptions and wonderful examples on, on these same fundamentals of composition. And like the other one, this one's 25, $26 on Amazon. Um, I certainly recommend them both. Eh, I'd probably start with this one, but both of them are wonderful. So for the next steps, remember, being a designer doesn't mean that you are horrible at, des at design. And it doesn't mean you have to be hor horrible design. It also means it's not really an excuse for being everything in Battleship Gray, like this is still Windows 3.1. All you need to do is practice those concepts. I did. This slide deck I built on my own. It's a relatively attractive slide deck from a non-designer built entirely by me. I didn't have any of the designers on, on my team at Arana build this slide deck for me. I built this. Aside from the two book covers that I stole online and put them into the PowerPoint, everything is all just basic shapes and words on a screen using the fundamentals uh, that, that, that we covered. 
And from there, uh, make your awesome. Um, this doesn't have to be, this, this isn't intended to make you uh, a, a supplement for art school or turn you into the designer. This is just there to give you those basic rules because we as software developers, we're great at following those, those basic rules and that applies to design as well. So we can just level up our designs just a little bit and ultimately make our users hate us a little bit less. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, I've got chat up here. Uh, Murphy's Law inevitably says that the best questions you're going to come up with are afterwards. So feel free to hit me up on most places. I am at Jay Harris, certainly on, on, on Twitter. Uh, you can also feel free to email me at any time, uh, jay at aranasoft.com. I'm more than happy to further engage there and extend that discussion into uh, email. Um, and uh, beyond that, aside from questions, um, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. So were there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just like because where I work in the accessibility space, obviously, even though I'm not myself a designer, I'm also having to kind of look at like how things are designed and how that's going to like impact the you know user experience, the usability. And so, like two things that like I've learned more recently that I, I didn't really realize until I started really doing accessibility testing, like as my main role was the whole idea of like being careful, like you know, mentioning proximity, you want to like be careful of like how close you put like very, con like or, uh, I guess it would be like, a, just like very vibrant colors and certain patterns, like how you position things, especially in a world where you know, now we're very frequently using mobile devices in the way that like a mobile device loads in content compared to like a desktop environment is very different. Uh, and so we've seen like an uptick in like issues where people will have like massive chunks of vibrant color on the screen that's just very hard on the eyes for anybody. And especially people that have certain cognitive light sensitivity issues, things like that. And we've also seen issues with like if people will have certain patterns on the screen, it can create a pseudo flashing effect. You know, we know to look for like an actively animated act flashing effect, but there's also those pseudo flashing effects that can be caused by how the proximity and like positioning of elements on a page. Um, really great example, if anyone wants to look it up, is like the uh, the disability pride flag. There was actually two different designs for it. The first one was like a very vibrant black background with zigzagging very brightly colored lines going kind of up the, the middle of it uh and it looked great but again it, it was actually created a flashing effect that was a lot more detrimental than you would want a disability pride flag to be which is why then two years later they actually released a different version of it that was meant to be like visually more visually friendly it's just a little bit muted and like they took out the zigzag pattern to make it so that it wouldn't have that same pseudo flashing effect. So it's kind of those other sort of people tidbits of knowledge. Well, great. Well, Jay, uh, so uh, the uh, accessibility certainly, I mean, we didn't have, uh, that's a different talk to go into the accessibility aspect. Certainly, uh, accessibility matters uh, and accessibility impacts uh, all of us, whether um, you know, not necessarily just uh, because we have mobility issues or uh, visual concerns um, in uh, any context. Um, everybody will have a situational disability from time to time. Um, think about the last time that you were using your phone outside and the sun was shining on it and you were at using a website that uh, the colors didn't have a lot of contrast to them and it's tough to differentiate all of the content on the screen when the sun inevitably reduces the contrast uh, of your display. Or um, further getting into the design, certainly being mobile first because of it, because yes, proximity of the fields 
uh, to their labels or the procs getting uh, grouping together the different control buttons uh, for our navigation is important, but they can also be uh, too close together uh, because things like our mouse cursor has a, a, a lot more definition to it. We can get a lot more precise with the tip of a mouse cursor than we can with our finger. And plenty of times using a desktop first interface uh, on our phone, well, we might have a hard time hitting that button because, you know, the tips of our finger are much wider, much bigger, much fatter than the tip of a, uh, of a mouse cursor. So with the challenge to just press on one button. I'm sure, uh, yeah, like the, the comment about having uh, too many vibrant colors, well, contrast can go to the extreme on the other end. If there is too many options, if there are too many colors, if there are too many size or shade variants, if everything is contrast, Nothing is. Contrast doesn't exist without the unity in the first place. So, yes, absolutely. Well, great. Well, Jay, again, thank you so much for, for the presentation. You know, I think the great part about this uh, presentation is that, uh, you know, this is stuff that as developers, we don't necessarily get it right away, but it really isn't that hard. You know, I mean, you know, because obviously, you know, a designer can go a whole lot farther with all this. It's definitely, I think, you know, Jay has presented us in a way that you know helps us, you know, present stuff like he said that you know people don't hate us for. You know? Right, and you know, not all of us on all of our teams have access to designers on our teams, and not all of us. Some of us we may have access design to designers, but not on every team because maybe our employer is like, oh, this is just a little one-off internal application and it's only going to be used by a few people in HR. So we really don't need to run that through all of the cosmetics of the pretty of designers. So we can still um, improve the situation for our consumers, for our users a little bit, even if our employers uh, make the decision to not give us access to, uh, to the talent, if you will. Absolutely. Awesome. So you want seven things? Awesome. Well, Jay, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Jay, hopefully I'll see you uh, next month in, in Seattle. All right. Sounds great. All right. See you. Thank you.